Um, kia ora, welcome to those of you who are able to join us tonight for Hem Libra and You. Um, very exciting developments for us um, in terms of haemophilia treatment. Um, I'm Dion. Um, I'm going to be um, looking after this webinar tonight, so we'll see how that goes. Um, and I have some amazing people who are going to speak to you about emesusumab or hem libra, um, the implications for you, the implications for them, um, and there's a time for um, question and answers as well. So um, first of all, a bit of ground rules for this. So for those of you that have tuned in, it would be really useful if you could use the chat function. Um, and the chat function is located at the bottom of your screen. So you'll see um, there is share screen, record, raise hand. If you look to the left, there's the chat function or there's the Q&A function as well. Um, in addition to that, you could try and raise your hand as well. So whatever whatever works for you, um, whatever works for us too, that's more to the point, um, we'll make sure that we get your questions answered. If for some reason technology fails, which does happen, I believe, it happens quite often, um, and if you're unable to ask your question, I'm unable to put your hand up or we can't see you, not only is this being recorded, but also um, we will be able to get back to you by email if you have any further questions um, and you were not able to somehow put your hand up, put the chat function on or anything like that. So just um, allowing for any of those technical problems that might happen. So um, I was asked just maybe to give a small um, background to Hem Libra or emesusumab. Um, of course, for haemophilia New Zealand, this has been something that we um, have wanted ever since it's been licensed in New Zealand. Um, some of you will know that there was limited access for some time for those um, with an inhibitor, which was absolutely fantastic and essential for those particularly with inhibitors. Um, but of course, now we have a case where um, for all people with um, severe haemophilia A and moving a little bit into moderate as well, um, Hemlibra or emesusumab is fully funded. And from October the 1st, um, people will have access to it. Of course, um, access means that um, this is through your haemophilia treatment center. Access means that if you have any questions about it, you know, we know that anyone in the center is more than uh, willing to answer your questions on it. And that's why not only do we have Vanessa here from the Auckland Haemophilia Center, we also have um, Dani, Michelle and Andrew to talk about the experience of, of emesusumab as well. Um, so we hope that um, this is informative for you. No question is a dumb question. I have plenty of questions. Um, apparently, I'm swapping over next Friday or maybe the following Monday, depending on how it goes. And I have just as many questions probably as the rest of you do. So um, that's probably enough from me um, just to say that, you know, we're very excited about this new development. So now I'm going to hand over to Vanessa, who will start us off for the evening. Thanks, Vanessa. Well, thanks, Dion. Yeah, welcome, everybody, and thanks for tuning in. Yeah, these are exciting times, and we cannot wait as treaters, yeah, to roll out this new product. Yeah, we've had a few people in our centre who have already started as they met the criteria prior, yeah, to the 1st of October. So we've had a couple, yeah, a few years, yeah, of a select few being on it already. But however, we're just waiting for the bulk of our patients to roll over, yeah, next week, yeah. And so today, the results are very promising. So keep in mind, it's still reasonably new to New Zealand. So it'll be a bit of a journey for both patient and, you know, their medical team. Yeah. So New Zealand's getting a new treatment and entering a new era for haemophilia A treatment, yeah. So I'll try not to use that word new too many times as I roll through. But Hem Libra is its brand name. Yeah. So it's Latin. Yeah. So if we break it down to hem, yeah, meaning blood, and Libra is free. So it's blood free. Yeah. So we're stepping into the pharmacy now. So it's a drug. Yeah. So it's um a carefully designed antibody. So it's not a factor anymore. Yeah. So it's a um, scientific name. Yeah, every drug gets a scientific name. It's called um, emesusumab. Yeah, so if we break that part down again, so emi is happiness in Japan, which is where it was um, designed. Yeah, 
And I cannot remember what CI means. So if anybody can, can you please let me know? I tried to look it up today, but I couldn't find it. But the end part of Amy Susan Matt, Amy, oh, sorry. Right. So the, the Zuzumab is actually a classification or it's family, drug family name, and it's a monoclonal antibody, so it's a protein. And I've actually got a screen. Oh, okay, sorry. I was going to share a picture, yeah, that I found on the internet, yeah. So I'm actually going to try to describe how it works. So it's in a very simple way to explain some very complex science, yeah. And I hope there's no scientists listening tonight because I don't want to butcher their work. But it's actually very clever, yeah. So if you can try to picture three friends at a party, you know, one's having problems making a connection, yeah. Um, and we'll call the problem one the factor rate, one in the middle, yeah, who's just trying to join the coagulation party. and. Um, with number factor nine, activated factor nine and ten, yeah. And heme libra, if you think of it like a little crab, yeah, with big claws, yeah, is um coming along, yeah, stepping in for the factor eight to bring the activated nine and the ten together. So it works a little bit like a chip or you know a, a link, yeah or a bridge just allowing that um, clotting process to be able to work. It's actually a very smart protein. It's always active, but only when required. Yeah. But with every drug, you have to weigh up the pros and cons. Yeah. So uh, so the, the benefits are, you know, the reduced bleeding rates is just really impressive. Yeah. There's a lot less needles, a lot less treatment, yeah. Um, it's got this amazing half-life, yeah. There's no more IVs for the people who are struggling with access. And it's got this beautiful, stable trough level. And um, it's around 15 to 20% from what I understand, yeah. But moving across to the drawbacks, yeah. Um, the most common side effects would be redness at the site that you give your treatment yeah it can get itchy um some describe a little bit of pain but to me that pain is more of a sting yeah and you get a headache yeah uh, you can get some tma and that doesn't stand for take my advice it's actually quite a serious you know that rare condition where it can um destruct your red blood cells and cause kidney and other organ failures but this only occurs when fever is used along with heme libra. So it's not recommended. Yeah. Um, it When you're ceasing heme libra, it can take up to six months to clear your system. Um, it's reasonably new to the market. I don't know if that's a drawback or not, but it's, it is new. Yeah. And I really wrestled with um, adding this one to the list, and it's called an anti heat libra antibody, yeah. It's a really low chance of that happening, but immune systems are very smart and they will respond to a foreign protein by making an antibody a bit like inhibitors to um, their factor, yeah. Okay, it's a weight-based, yeah, drug, yeah. So you'll, um, it will be calculated by your hematologist, yeah. And it's important before you start, yeah, to stop all fever and Novo 7 24 hours beforehand. Um, however, I must note that some hematologists may choose to continue with your prophylaxis, your Advate or Adinovate, for the first week. Yeah, but not all hematologists would do this, but some will. So once you have your dose, yeah, we go into a loading phase, yeah. There are four vial sizes available, yeah. Um, loading will take four weeks exactly. It's given subcut, yeah. Um, it comes colour-coded as you see, oh, so you can't see. There's four vial sizes. Each cap has a different colour. If you can just remember the blue one is cannot be mixed with other vials, yeah. They, they don't like different concentrations put together. Um, 
there's no um, adjusting. Yeah, you can't go home, yeah, and say, I'll oh, just add a little bit more or oh, don't worry about that bit. Yeah, or if you forget to take, there's no double ups either. You can't take it, oh, I forgot to take it early this week and then have the next dose the next day. Yeah. Um, it's So when you're loading, it's it should be one week apart exactly. Yeah. Just let it build up in your system. Yeah. And once your loading is finished, yeah, you uh, move on to a maintenance dosing. So that starts at week five. And then your dosing is reduced, yeah, if if you wish. So you have um, an option if you would like to go once a week, once a fortnight or once a month. But just keep in mind that the dosage will vary with each frequency. So if you choose to stay uh, on your same dose throughout your loading, you will go on to fortnightly levels, yeah. Some people might say uh, once a week works best for me, so they want half their dose. Other people say I want monthly, I want less, yeah. Um, our hematolo some of our hematologists here would actually prefer the weekly and the fortnightly levels as that gets better stable levels longer term compared to the month, yeah. Um, there is a maximum dose per injection site. You can't use any more than two mils at each site. So sometimes um, you might be in between a dose, so you might have two vials to give, so you might have two injections to give, yeah. But if that's not working, if your child's too small, yeah, um, come back and talk to us. We can talk to the hematologist. We can see what we can work out to just get it to work better. Um, it's given subcut, so that's a new method for the haemophilia group, yeah, and that means that subcutaneously it goes under the skin. Um, there's three sites that are good, yeah, so you can have your stomach, yeah, just five centimetres away from the belly button. Uh, the front of the thighs are good or the back of the arms, yeah. Um, it, the sites, it's recommended that the sites to be rotated, Avoid any reddened areas, mole scars, hard lumps, bruises, just tender spots. Yeah. And if you're a diabetic or you're having something else subcutaneously, um, it's wise just to choose another spot where your heme labor goes. Yeah. Um, testing, yeah. Um, testing with hem labor is hard, but it isn't required for therapy. Yeah. So your routine coagulation tests, such as your APTTs, your factor eights, yeah, your lupus um, inhibitor assays will all be interfered with him Libra, yeah, and can give false readings, yeah. So in emergency, you must tell them that you're, you know, you're taking this drug, yeah. Each centre will be handing out patient cards, yeah, you can either take a photo, stick it in your phone, or download it on the app if you find it hard to explain. But it, and we will do clinic letters and put alerts on, but it's good information to show, yeah. Um, testing, we may do some testing uh, a little bit later if there's any pending surgery or if there's any unexplained bleeding or if we're worried about compliance, yeah. But we need a bovine essay to do that and not every lab has that available, yeah. Um, and just another note, remember, it stays in your system for six months after the last injection. Yeah. So storage, I don't really have to explain storage to the haemophilia group. Like they, they get it you know, quite well. But this product uh, is also in cold chain. So it's got to stay between minus two and eight degrees and you must protect from light. So just keep it in the box. Yeah. Um, cannot be frozen, so don't shove it down the back of your fridge so you can get your beers in and it freezes. Yeah, just put it in a safe spot in the fridge that will keep it um, cold. Um, don't shake it. Yeah. Um, once you remove from the fridge, it can be stored out of the fridge under 30 degrees for seven days in total. So if you pull it out for an hour, it can go back in the fridge, but it just loses that hour of that seven days. Yeah. Um, 
And just to add it about storage, before you're injecting, yeah, it's important to bring to room temperature. Don't try to run it under taps or anything. Just let it, you know, give it 15, 20 minutes just to naturally away from the light to come to room temperature. Otherwise, it's like cement, you know, trying to give it. Um, we come with um, equipment, little kits, and they will come be delivered. I'm not sure if you can see this. Yeah, sorry. It's a little kit. Oh, looks like a black box. Yeah. Um, those kits can be delivered to your home and they will have everything you need in that box um, to give your treatment. Um, I, th I think the kits work nicely. I, I, they're free and they're less wastage. There's less space. You know, you don't have to put these in the fridge. Um, comes to your door. We just ask if you could just let us know when you're down to your last couple and we can get a, arrange for another one to come. Um, records, yeah. Uh, we always like records, yeah, at the hospital. So if you can just keep an eye, I think it's important to know your last dose or the date of your last dose and the site. Um, people get busy. Yeah, you, it's easy to forget. Um, it just treatment's not as regular, so it is easy to slip your mind. But if you would like a, a paper diary, could you just please let us know? We can see if we can arrange from you know, somehow, otherwise just mark it on your phone or I've been telling patients just to mark their hen Libra box, yeah, so if you give your treatment up or right abdo, you can write on your next box the date when it's due and just write up a left abdo the next site. So if you forget, you can grab your box out, it's written on there. Um, so I'll just run through some important points, yeah. So hen libra is not to be used to treat acute bleeds. Yeah, it will not get you high enough in your peak to stop that from happening. So um, you still may require um, some factor eight. Yeah, and if you do, just give us a call. Um, but it, it's important to check in with us because your dose may need to be dosed adjusted. Yeah because your baseline is now a bit higher than what it was. was. It, it's easy to forget to give an injection, but it's really expensive to reload. So I strongly suggest just to document, yeah. Whatever the dose, just remember no more than two mils per injection site. Remember the 30 mil vials cannot be mixed with any other. This stuff can only go subcut, not IV. Any missed doses, no double ups. Yeah, you can't take two on the same day. Yeah. So if you're um, if you're interested, contact your local haemophilia centre. They can provide some training and education that would be offered. Yeah. Um, you still need to come to clinic, people. Yeah. We we're still good at ED. Yeah, plans, yeah. We can check your joints. We can provide some travel letters. We can help you. Online, there's also Roche have done a, a med wallet. It's also got some very good information if you need to um, explain or share with people. Otherwise, some centres will vary from place to place how they roll out, but just give us a call. We'll, we'll talk you through it just Roll up, yeah. Yeah, and that's it. Yeah, thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Vanessa. Um, I think maybe what we'll do um, is we'll move on to um, the stories as well and then um, take questions at the end so everyone who's online gets the full picture. Um, now that was great, and um, particularly the note of where, where to store um, emosuzumab and making sure it's not s sitting in the back of the freezer or, or disturbing any alcoholic beverages. I think they're very important points um, <laughs> for, for us members know. to know. Yeah. yeah. So um, how about, okay, um, what we'll do is we'll go straight on to um, Danny and Michelle. 
Um, Michelle, looks like you've got a bit going on there for you, but um, maybe Danny can start um, and then um, we'll go on to Andrew after that. So over to you, um, Danny or Michelle or whoever's starting first. Thank you. Good. Thanks, Dion. Um, yeah, I'm I'm Danny Ustazen. Um, I'm the proud dad of Benya Ustazen. Michelle and Benya is just on another device because we're not um, in the same location at the moment. Um, so I'm not sure whether... Um, so he may give you a wave over there. Um, I think that's his, well, that's his sister. Um, I can't, can't see him there. Oh, there he is. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so Benya um, was diagnosed with um, severe hemophilia A on the 18th of September 2019. Um, and uh, I'm, uh, so I'd just firstly like to acknowledge that obviously all of us have got a story to tell. And each of our stories are undoubtedly um, mixes of dramatic, exciting, expire, inspiring, and sometimes sad. And um, so I'm thankful to be able to, for the opportunity to share this story with you guys. Um, and hopefully by doing so, provide some answers, um, perspective, or gains, and gain some insight and answers ourselves. Um, and before I set out to give some of the details with, with, about when leading up to there's just a couple of things that I'd like to mention. So for us, um, we the, the diagnosis came as quite a shock, um, to say the least. Um, we didn't we didn't know what hemophilia was really um, before Benny was diagnosed. Um, there was no family history that we know of, um, no friends with the condition or any scenario that exposed us to it in the past. Um, and initially, I was of the opinion um, that most of the bruising that we observed was due to, you know, siblings playing with each other and stuff because Benya has got an older sister, as you would have seen. Um, but it was Michelle's motherly instinct that um, caused us to follow the path that led to Benya's diagnosis. Um, and af even after the diagnosis, it was pretty surreal. Benya was diagnosed relatively early, um, being seven months old when he was diagnosed. Um, and so at that stage, it wasn't really moving enough to injure himself severely. Um, or put himself at too great a risk. There was a, the occasional bruise um, and lump, but nothing serious with regards to uh, joint bleeds or head injuries. Um, it took another eight months and three um, hospital visits or emergency room visits for um, false alarms um, with two bum bleeds and a nosebleed um, to get to his first joint bleed on like the, on the 12th of May 2020. This was obviously during COVID. Um, the scary part for us was there was no obvious trauma, which most you most of you guys will know about as well, like not being able to attribute any bleed to something specific. Um, we, at that stage, you know, had a bit of a um, battle with the hospital to try and get us both in the room because we were only allowed once. But after some negotiation, we were able to put him into a room where we, both Michelle and myself, was, about, was there for his first factor eight treatment. It's quite an experience for us seeing a 14-month-old um, being given medicine um, intravenously. Um, first attempt was unsuccessful, so was the second. Thankfully, the third attempt was successful um, and they were able to give him the medicine that he needed to stop his elbow bleed. It was his left elbow that started, that, that had his first joint bleed. Um, and then we didn't realise that that's going to be sort of the theme of a lot of the hospital visits to come. Um, obviously, there was a lot of traumatic experiences for his treatment um, because of the nature of hemophilia. When they tried um, to get a vein, it meant that you know, if they were unsuccessful the next week, there was still a bruise there. And so it made um, more attempts, you know, likely to be unsuccessful again. Uh, so it was like a vicious circle. Um, a failed attempt made it harder to get a successful attempt. Um, and then, so there was a lot of um, those sort of experiences, but there's one in particular that stood out to us. And that was on um, Monday. So he usually got his treatment on Mondays. Um, on the 13th of July in 2020, Benya went in for his routine factor eight treatment after four uns unsuccessful attempts um, on both of his hands and both of his feet. Um, it was decided to postpone the treatment until Friday. Um, this coincided with his normal uh, medical team being away. Um, and so back on the Friday, tried two more times, didn't work um, by the medical team that was there. It was decided to get him back on the Saturday and put him under an anesthesia to get his routine factor treatment on, on the Saturday. 
Um, that is that Saturday after about six hours at a hospital, um, you know, it was relatively su successful. He got his treatment, his routine treatment. Um, or from our perspective, from a family perspective, all of the visits to the hospital put strain on working life. And I, I know that there'll be people out there with similar or um, even, you know, more interesting stories. Um, it put, you know, both Michelle and myself work full time meant that we had to alternate taking half a day off. If we had to go back on the Friday or Saturday, that created some other headaches. And we knew that in the future that could potentially be two to three times a week. Um, so Benny was at this stage known amongst uh, some of the medical staff being, he was pretty notorious for, he had very difficult vein access. Um, he also had reactions to, to, to the fact of treatment and things like that. Um, and all of that sort of played on your mind. Um, there were weeks where I had to go away for work as I am away at the moment. Um, and when I touched down from the plane, uh, on a Monday in Christchurch, I'd be, greeted by an email from Michelle, a very cheery email, or not email, sorry, um, voicemail, you know, saying that what they j just been through and um, and they ha we, we'd have to go back on the weekend to get him his weekly treatment under anesthesia. Um, so we, both of us sort of became shadows of our formal selves. And to be frank, it started affecting the way that we interacted with our children, um, overly protective out of fear um, that, that something bad may happen to Benya. Um, Louisa Marie was just a four-year-old trying to play with her brother, but she had to walk on eggshells and good luck to anyone trying to get a four-year-old to walk on eggshells around their baby brother, trying to play with them. Even sort of previously exciting thoughts of planning holidays and things like that became a thought of, well, what are we now confined, confined to only holidaying near hemophilia treatment centers and things like that. Um, so all of this, that, all of that would probably be a ring, you know, they would, like I said, there'd be a, a lot of people out there with similar stories um and we were fortunate enough to be able to get benya treatment treated with um emicizumab um the decision from our side just as a parent sort of to put your kid on a new medicine that as vanessa mentioned earlier is not as well known it wasn't taken lightly by us but for us um it just they, we just came to the conclusion that we simply couldn't continue along the road that we were going along at that stage um, and so we made the choice um, and for, we're fortunate enough to be able to make that choice and be given that choice um, and so emicism app for us has had a definite impo impact on what Benya is able to do how he interacts with his family and friends and how traumatic the prophylactic treatment is in the past with factor 8 treatment Benya would be in tears the whole of the time it took to get a line in he also seemed to show a reactive reaction to the treatment um, whether that was on the odd occasion where it took five minutes and only one attempt to get the line in, or whether that was 20 minutes and four attempts, uh, or ending up under anesthesia to get this weekly medicine. This was quite traumatic for him, and uh, he, he would struggle against it. This also meant that us as parents had to physically hold him down um, for them to administer the treatment. It turned out for us, uh, after him starting him on emicizumab, he didn't always cry. Um, when we administered the emicizumab, it also meant that we were now freed up in terms of we didn't have to go to hospital for that half a day every week um applying the imla cream and all of that we were able to start doing the treatments after a trial period of doing it in the hospital we were able to start doing that at home um so it freed us up enormously um nowadays he's four years and seven months old at the moment and nowadays he's actively involved with his treatment he opens up the syringe you know the the the, the syringes and the and uh, and just helps with cleaning the areas where, where the injection is to be made. Um, he wants to try it, but we're not comfortable as parents yet to let, let him have a go. Um, but we also immediately noticed that on the factor treatment previously, um, Benny was having more regular bleeds, even if these were just superficial and it was visible, um, you know, uh, it was visible how much more um, he was bleeding on the factor rather than Um The bruises on his legs, um, you know, would have lumps and things like that. Whereas on the emicizumab, the bruising that we noticed, that with the, so I'm not going to say that there's no bruising, but he, it, to us as parents, it looks a bit more normal comparable to his sister and his younger brother as an example. Um, and so it sort of presents this kid bruising that we can remember, you know, from kids, um, from being kids and things like that. Um, and so, yeah, um, we, we've we also, for us as a family, it's also made a big difference in terms of we are a little bit more relaxed after having been on that treatment for a while. Um, we are more relaxed 
just with the way that he, he interacts with his siblings, we're not that overbearing parent anymore. Well, we, we keep, had to keep reminding them, be careful, you know, you're not allowed to do that. They, he can now roll around on the grass with his sister without us having, you know, um, an anxiety attack or something like that. Um, and so for us, that's really made um, made a big difference, having that freedom to do the treatment at home and also seeing what a difference it made in the daily bruising that you could see. Um, we have a few, we, we, unfortunately, we, at that stage, we were a little, I guess you can almost say in a little bit of denial, we sort of didn't want to take a lot of photos of him, sort of didn't want to be reminded that he's going through all of that. And we didn't take a lot of photos of his um, big injuries and stuff, but we do have a couple of photos around where we are, you know, you can see the difference between the normal bruising under with under factor and the normal bruising under Um And so really what I'm trying to convey here is that I hope you can hear this message with the ears um, and heart of a parent who, you know, after a long struggle, finally has some breathing space, um, you know, even if it's only until the next challenge. And but hopefully by that time, you know, the courage may have lifted and our tired bones may have rested and the fires of hope will be burning in our eyes, being willing to take in on those challenges because there will definitely be more challenges to come. But I sincerely hope that a lot of the people out there listening to this now, um, you know, you'll have a similar positive experience with from this. And I. Um, yeah, and you, you'll be able to overcome the challenges that comes um, over your path. Um, yeah, so thank you very much for that. Oh, thank you so much for sharing your story. And um, it provokes some questions in the chat, which we've some of us have attempted to answer, but we'll probably return back to them as well um, at the end um, of Andrew's talk. So, yeah, thank you so much. And, oh, look, we have another visitor as well, so... Hello to you. Um, okay, so I'm now going to hand over to um, Andrew Scott, who's also going to give um, a perspective on um, emicizumab or hem libra, um, particularly in the inhibitor space. So over to you, Andrew. Thanks, Dion, and um, thanks to Danny and Michelle for sharing your story as well. I um, That insight as a parent is so valuable. Um, and yeah, I, I know, and I guess I want to reaffirm that as someone who's uh, gotten older and now I have a very different relationship with my parents, I have a lot of admiration and understanding of the difficulties of those earlier times, um, but I also don't remember them negatively. Um, so I just want to encourage you guys with that and, and thank you for sharing your story. Um, uh, yeah, hello, I'm Andrew. I uh, have, I'm 23 and I uh, began my treatment with emicizumab about four, four and a half years ago. Um, I am a severe factor eight uh, hemophiliac. So I have um, had lots of issues with uh, hemophilia in my younger years and all through high school and primary school as well. Um, I developed an inhibitors. So um, I had multiple periods of time where even my just replacement factor product wasn't working um, and have had a very complex uh, case of uh, my hem hemophilia in general. Um, from about 2010 onwards, I was on uh, daily rituximab, so daily intravenous uh, injections for the um, factor replacement product. Um, and then uh, from two periods of my inhibitors, I was, uh, I had the um, uh, uh, rituximab as a uh, um, treatment to that. Um, and uh, then my inhibitors still returned after that. And when I had periods of having my inhibitors, uh, that would look like basically just continuing to have more and more bleeds where um, even despite having um, treatment or having time off school or in my wheelchair, I was still having more um, bleeding episodes. Um, in 2018, when I was at my worst, I was in hospital for, uh, I think, 20% or I, I missed 30% of my schooling and uh, for those of you who know my family my parents sent me to school even if I got out of hospital the day before um, so uh, that this says something about how much time I was missing um, and I was in hospital bleeding once a week as an average for most of um, 2018 um, and I was having type periods of bed rest where I was still bleeding more. Um, I have developed osteoarthritis as a result of uh, repeat internal bleeds into my knees. Um, 
but to be honest, uh, I think I was pretty optimistic for a hemophiliac um, for a, a long time. Um, I am very grateful for my family and for what they've done for me and for the foundation. Um, and I think I was sort of definitely of the perspective of like, ah, oh, cool, I've kind of got this balance of things figured out. I'm kind of used to my loss in life and I, and I don't think that um, it necessarily uh, is going to improve. And Emi Suzumab sort of came along uh, we sort of had to take a bit of a risk because um, we knew that if I did my rituximab treatment, that would make me ineligible for emisuzumab for a few more years. Um, and so instead of doing that, we waited um, and just sort of pushed through a year of inhibitors um, to uh, try and secure uh, funding for emisuzumab. So to prove that um, it was something that would be financially beneficial um, for the, unfortunately, it does come down to money at the end of the time, and so my hematologist could prove that the amount that I was costing in replacement factor products in hospital stays was greater than what the cost of emisuzumab would be. Um, so, as far as I believe, I was the first non-trial patient in New Zealand, um, and the difference has been incredible. I mean, even when I haven't been on my inhibitors. Um, I've gone from bleeding at an average of, um, like looking across, um, some of my bleeding records, um, I'd have an average of two a month. And then during my inhibitors, I'd have an average of about three a month. Um, I've had in the last five years, two internal bleeding episodes. And both of those, um, have been from trauma. So from uh, me doing something silly, uh, as opposed to, uh, just sort of it, kind of happening without really understanding it. Um, I am so, so excited that so many more people are about to get access to it um, because it has been truly life-changing for me. Um, in 2018, I was uh, leaving high school and looking at university and university didn't seem like something that would be feasible for me. Um, I had not taken a bus because I hadn't been able to rely on being able to walk short distances, you know, I couldn't make a plan without knowing that I was going to be able to have someone to drive me, be able to park close enough that I can crutch it in. Um, and university just didn't seem like an option for me. Um, and I've been able to complete my undergraduate and I'm now working on my postgraduate degree. Um, I have thrown myself back into the world of performing arts and dance and drama, um, which as a child, I enjoyed, but sort of had to say, oh, well, this is sort of not entirely feasible for a haemophiliac, so I'll just kind of put that on pause. Um, and then I've been able to pick up that dream sort of once again. So it's really miraculous um, for me. Um, yeah, I think uh, one of the things that I get quite emotional about when thinking about any Susamab is... Um, how I forget how oppressive hemophilia was in my life compared to how it is now. I have so many relationships and friendships that uh, don't even necessarily know that I have this disability. Whereas when I was a kid, that would be such an important thing for people to know and, and identify me by. Um, and it's crazy to me that so many of my university friends and my workmates only know the healthy version of me. Um, because I haven't had so many repeat bleeding episodes, I've been able to actually build muscle and support my joints, which has led to less pain from arthritic pain and less uh, uh, just less bleeding episodes. So it's that vicious cycle that many hemophiliac families will know of uh, when you have that bleeding episode, you have to um, ease off and, and sort of relax. And that means that the muscle gets weaker. And then when you come back uh, uh, back into um, trying to walk around or, or use the joint normally, you just cause new damage because there's no muscles there to repair it. So actually being able to support my um my joints and um yeah just i even just the little practical things of the amount of time i can spend walking um from university and stuff like that which never seemed feasible before um in terms of the transitional period um there was some uh, definitely some challenges that i didn't expect um uh that i think are valuable to share um I think uh, for anyone who's been treating for a long time on uh, uh, replacement factor products, um, 
we you get into your rhythms in terms of knowing your body knowing when to treat um feeling that pain in the evenings and then going oh i need to do some treatment now so that it can be healing and i'll see if i've got a bleed in the morning and and learning to identify and, and really um yeah uh, observe your your body signs and, and that sort of thing um and i I, that process on Hemlibra on emesuzumab is very, very different um, because for the first time in my life, I've had to really trust my body and trust that it is uh, that it is working. And so there's been times where I've injured myself or I've just been feeling a bit sore at the end of the day, especially in the first few months of switching to emesuzumab, where I was like, oh, I have to treat. I have to I have to immediately go into the, the you know, the recovery process. I need to contact the hemat hematology center. I need to do all these things. And it was actually really, really difficult to to not just reach for that sort of, oh, I, I need to do this thing instantly. Um, and I think that that is something that a lot of uh, people as they switch will find is really difficult. The things that really supported me and helped me in that was being in frequent contact with my hematologist and my um, treatment centers um, and having them remind me that, you know, my, my levels are, you know, <laughs> miraculously at that uh, almost normal, right? Um, and so my body will repair itself and look after itself um, and to just have a bit of patience there, which is a really hard habit to uh, to sort of unlearn the uh, sort of anxiety response to a little bit of pain. It's 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 hard to, to swap. I also found it really strange and sort of um, uh, <laughs> sort of emasculating sw swapping from doing my intravenal to my subcutaneous uh, where I've been injecting myself since I was like eight. Uh, and then going to subcutaneous where, especially for the first year or so, even though it's just like it's a smaller needle, it feels less serious. And certainly from a medical perspective, it's there's way less things that can go wrong subcut than there are intravenous. But it just having to do it at a new site and like the pushing it straight into your stomach and not in this way that I'd sort of learnt, um, I, it was hard. And there was I would frequently find myself, even though it was a smaller needle in a smaller process, just sort of standing there holding the needle for like five minutes while I had to hype myself up to do the needle. Um, and it does hurt a little bit more more than a thin uh, average um, intravenous injection um, just because it's a bit stingy in the skin um, but I guess I would say that it hurts a lot less than when you make a mistake with the intravenous one where you tissue it or um, you you know uh, go through or hit a nerve or something like that um, so yeah it, it can sting a little bit um, but it's well worth it um even just little things like bruising i'm um, kind of like echoing what danny mentioned um i've had so many less issues with bruising i've been able to see bruises um that fade a lot faster and the times that i have had injuries um or times when i was like oh that's definitely a bleeding episode um they recovered within a matter of four days as opposed to multiple weeks um yeah, uh, and that was really, really fantastic. Um, yeah, and I think it's given me so much more agency with my health and agency with um, within myself. And it came at a really good time for me as well. But I just think that I so, so strongly encourage everyone to use this because it is such a game changer in terms of the uh, agency that it gives you. You don't have to be reactionary planners anymore. You know, you can actually just sort of sit and forget this, do it, and then go on with your week, you know, and, and even like some of the smaller practical things like the size of the treatment, um, you know, I can store now like four months of treatment in an ice cream container, which is insane compared to the amount of factor eight, I, you know, a two fridge situation like many um, uh, bleeding families. Um, and so that makes travel way easier. Um, when I'm going away for like a weekend, uh, if I know that I'm going to be within like three hours drive of home or an, or a hospital, I don't have to take treatment with me because treating with more um, Hemlibra or uh, more Emisuzumab isn't going to make it better like it's it's got such a long half-life and it's in your body for so long that it's not like immediately after you take it there's a spike so if i treat it on monday and then on wednesday um you know i'm going on a, a bit of a trip and then i hurt myself treating with more emisuzumab isn't actually going to help so i don't have to travel with this expensive piece of medication if i'm um you know going for just a, like a two-day trip or something like that um 
the little things in terms of uh, just the amount of time that it takes is it's way shorter. Um, there's less complications with it um, in terms of like for universities is a big thing I found just like, you know, it's way faster to quickly do in the morning than sometimes you could have complications with factor eight uh, replacement products. It'll be a real game changer for those, uh, you know, heading off to school in the morning or that sort of thing. Um, in response to there was a question about um, changing treatment days because it is in like the half-life is in your system for so long like I imagine most patients will go on to it um, like the hematologists are recommending is taking it once a week um, you take it once a week but it's in your system for about four to five weeks and it's just got that long long bell curve so you sort of never really um, you never really have that big trough like we used to uh, you know you, you would have learnt for um, other factor placement products that we would more sort of want to dose up right before we're going to do some sort of big strenuous activity but it doesn't work that way anymore so I can take something on Monday and even if my event is on Friday um, it still has the same amount of coverage um, compared to if the event had been on a Tuesday um, but what that also means is um, let's say my normal treatment day is a Monday and I get to the end of my Monday night and I go oh shoot I forgot to do uh, MSUSMAB this morning then I could go, oh, okay, well, I could do it tonight or I could do it tomorrow morning. Um, and then from that day onwards, Tuesday's just become my treatment day. Like you want to keep really good track of it because you, it's a medication and it's an expensive medication and we need to treat it with respect and to look after our bodies. Um, so making sure that I'm keeping record of this because going from treating daily to treating once a week, especially when I when routines change with university or, or into a, a holiday, there are times where I go, oh shoot, in the past eight days I haven't taken it or something like that. But um, it's not like if you forget it, you have to um, wait a whole loop before you can take it again. You can just immediately treat. Um, and But just keeping that record is, is really important. Um, there is an app to record. And in terms of during the like loading dose, uh, BJ gave a really good explanation of it recently at an event that I was at where he was talking about our um, during the loading dose. It's like we're a, like we're a percentage bar or like a, a you know a glass of water, and our glass we need to get it really full of Hem Libra, and then each week. 10% of the hem libra fades away and we're just topping up another 10%. So if you miss a bunch of weeks in a row, then the glass is down here and topping up each 10%, you're only getting to this point, but we want to keep everyone at this point. Um, so that's why keeping on top of it is really important, but that's also why um, when you have had it and when you're already at 100% uh, of the product in your system taking more doesn't actually increase your you know it doesn't increase your blood clotting or anything like that i've had two surgeries under emisuzumab as well and both times the only other medication that i required was uh, my factor 7 bypassing agent as an inhibitors patient um yeah i think that's most of what i have to say um and then into the questions and answers but yeah um it's a fantastic product everyone should get on it thank you so much andrew for also sharing and i can guarantee you that andrew was not paid in any way by any pharmaceutical company to make <laughs> to promote these messages this is very much personal experience so um thank you andrew um thank you danny thank you vanessa um and michelle as well for your time um this evening um, I see a comment there in the chat from Ross that it is such a game changer um, and great too that Leo's coming up for three years um, without a bleed on Hem Libra. And yeah, I agree with you. So glad that it's being, you know, made available to a lot more people. Um, and, you know, so this will directly benefit a lot more. And it's something that we've been really um, keen to happen for some time. And we're really, really happy that um, this decision has been made and that it will be made available um, to more people. Um, so I think we've been answering some of the questions um, as we've been going along. Um, so hopefully that's um, answered a lot of the questions there. Um, but I'm going to kick off um, with a question, and it's for you, Vanessa. Um, and, and that question is, um, if you're on factor eight right now, um, when do you need to stop? You made a comment about um, about hematologists making a decision around sort of, you know, when you have your last dose before you start on emosuzumab. So I was just keen to hear a bit more about that. Okay, so some some of our hematologists um, are happy for you to start loading. Yeah, 
um, with no factor eight, yeah. But other ones um, would like your prophylaxis to continue for about a week, yeah. Just while you're loading, you know, as you go up, you're increasing upwards, um, you know, I think the first week, just say you get three or four percent, is that really enough to stop a bleed from happening? Which is why they would like some extra cover in the background, you know, to prevent any further bleeding. Yeah. yeah. But for the people that I've personally flipped over, um, I haven't seen any any bleeding. Yeah. And they didn't have any prophylaxis. In fact, every time I saw them in the center. Their bruising was less. They reported feeling better. It just got better and better. Yeah. But some it's up it's up to the hematologist who that patient's under. Yeah. Okay. I see a few comments online. They're talking about um, storing some factor at home. Yeah. Uh, uh, we don't mind if you have stock that you haven't used. Yeah, and you want to keep some close by you know, for emergencies, yeah, that's fine. That works with us too. With As people stay on it longer, they build up more confidence and sometimes they say, no, we don't need that anymore. We'll call you when we need it. Yeah. yeah. And that's probably a yeah. good supplementary question from me, Vanessa, yeah. and then I'll hand over to some others. And that is, um, what do we do with this factor eight? So, you know, um, I can see um, sitting in the blurred background or the black background behind me, you know, some factor that will expire soon and some, there's no way I'm going to use it by hopefully next Friday when I'm loaded up. So what's our plans or do we have any for what happens with all this factor? So uh, for, for me, uh, I've been trying to um, run stocks down uh, for patient stocks down at home. I don't mind if there's a small supply left but I don't want a whole fridge full, yeah, because we don't want to be wasteful either, yeah. No. So um, I've had many orders come in today saying I'm out of factor, but I'm when I reorder, I'm just ordering just a small amount. So hopefully that will get them through the next few weeks and then, and then we'll start flipping them. Yeah. Yeah, but not everybody wants to flip, so it's an individual choice, yeah. So some people are very happy on their current treatment, yeah. But um, all I can say, it, it it really delivers, yeah. It it is a game changer. What Andrew said. Yep. No. Yeah. I I couldn't agree more with that. Um. There's a question um from Dan Burgess here, and I think Andrew's going to pick it up. Um. And that is, let's say you've completed the loading up phase. What do you recommend if you have a more serious accident, like a knock? To the head, for example. So I'll start with you, Andrew, and then open to anyone else who'd like to take that one on. Um, thanks, Dion. Uh, I think that the like the way that I've tried to think of it is like having this uh, having this treatment makes me like a uh, a normal person, but a uh, careful normal person, right? So if I have a knock to the head, that's a serious knock to the head. Even if I was a normal person, I would get in contact with a medical professional to assess me because it's a knock to the head and my head's my valuable bits. Um, and so if uh, in terms of the, uh, in response to emucizumab, I'm getting in contact with your haemophilia treatment team and they will have a treatment plan um, and so asking these questions on that case by case basis but uh, getting in contact with your team to ask that question um, because they'll give you the yep go ahead quickly get treated um, but yeah using the the same sort of reaction time and instincts that we have um, developed as our, um, uh, our bleeding patients but adjusting them in terms of uh, our response so keeping that level of communication really open um, but still treating injuries with that level of care right um, and so yeah just being in contact with your team is the first step um, in my case because I'm a, a, a inhibitors patient even if I were to put more um, uh, bleeding uh, factor eight uh, product in it's not actually going to help um, so I don't keep any factor eight at home. And um, as uh, has been said by Vanessa, there are some issues in terms of specific factor eight products where actually adding them on top of your um, hemlibra can be an, an issue. Um, so yeah, making sure that you know 
what the response is and having an emergency response plan mapped out. A um, bit long-winded, but I think that gets the gist. Uh, can I just jump in? Sorry. Um, head injuries should be taken seriously. Yeah. And remember, um, your level, your baseline level will rise from, you know, 15 to 20%, but that's a long way short of normal. So if you've got any head injury symptoms, yeah, uh, you, you need to get that sort, you need to get that seen to. Because there's still, you, there's still the possibility that you can still bleed from trauma. I have a question um, for Vanessa, actually. Um, Andrew mentioned going away for a couple of days and not needing to take his, his treatment with him, which is fantastic. What about if you're going away for a few weeks and uh, what's the process for, for taking your treatment then on Henry Row? Oh, thanks, Bill. Yeah, um, we had this question asked a couple of weeks ago from a family who were visiting. They were coming in from overseas. Um, they were here for a while and it's really hard when you're traveling with small children and trying to keep things in cold chain yeah so I, I spoke to BJ who has many good contacts overseas yeah and um, that one of the nurses he spoke to I think in the UK mentioned that they often slide up yeah so if you take your treatment weekly yeah um, you can switch to monthly, yeah, so to cover your month away, yeah, and then when you come back, when that month's up, you can go back to your weekly regime again. So it was, I think it added a little bit of flexibility to it, yeah, which, which was handy. But um, I wouldn't, if I was on holiday locally, yeah, and I forgot to pack my treatment, I wouldn't be rushing home because it was, you know, due on Friday. Yeah. Um, finish your holiday, come home, and then take your dose. But when you're loading, it's important to load, yeah, uh, you know, seven days apart. But when you're on maintenance dosing, you've got a little bit more freedom. Yeah. But when, if you forget, you take, yeah, and then seven days or whatever, seven, 14, you know, four weeks. That's when you load again. Yeah. Okay, we've got a couple of questions coming through on the chat. So um, one from Nikki, Greg, and Connor is: What about with more significant joint injuries? Do you treat preventively, or you wait until evidence of the bleed? No, if if you have a joint bleed, yeah, you would need to treat. Yeah, yeah. But remember that um, heme libra you don't treat bleeds with. You still need to go back to your factor eight. Yeah. But if you're bleeding on heme libra, we would dearly like to know because um, we don't like to see that, yeah. Is it fair to say, Vanessa, that heme libra doesn't prevent ble bleeds, but it treats bleeds? Is that a fair statement? No, it doesn't treat bleeds. It, it raises your baseline up, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then if you bleed, you it just heme libra will not give you the peaks of your factor eight, yeah. So if you take factor eight or whether it's a dynavate or a bait, you could go from zero up to, I don't know, 70 or 80. Some even get higher, yeah, for that first day or two, and then you fall. Heen Libra will not get you up into that normal range for it to stop a bleed. It will get you to your baseline 15 to 20%. Um, and there's one from Sam here. Would you still travel with factor eight? So what about, you know, Packing some factor eight alongside your hem libra. What do you advise about that? Yeah, I think if you're going remote and you're away from a hospital, I still think that's wise just to take a treatment. You don't have to take lots, you know, like um, a, a fridge full with you. Yeah, but I, I think it's kind of wise just to take it. Yeah, I would. Yeah. Great, and I've got one coming in from Rory here. How does Hem Libra support active sport? Which could be a wide category there, Rory, but what do, what do you think, Vanessa? Uh, uh, or, or Andrew, or uh, anybody? Andrew. <laughs> yeah. You can go, Andrew. 
You okay, go, and then you can correct me when uh, with uh, making sure that it's accurate. Uh, no. it, it doesn't mean suddenly rugby, Rory, is a, is, a, is a shame, but it doesn't mean that it's all green light on all the stuff that we've been careful about for ages. Um, but I would say just from my experience, I've been able to engage in sport a lot more freely because I haven't had to plan treatment cycles around sport. Like if some mates say, hey, we're going to be hitting a volleyball round uh, this weekend at, at the park, I'll go, oh, yeah, cool. I can jump in with that. Whereas in the past, I'd have to go, oh, do I really want to risk a bit of damage? Do I really want to get a joint bleed? So there's still stuff that uh, I've been told to avoid in terms of sport, but I'm way more supported, even just in things like gymming and um, just sort of minor social sport. Um, I'm way more supported in terms of um, protecting my muscles. I don't have long periods of recovery a a after intense sporting um, times. Um, so it has made that a lot more, my endurance in sport a lot better. Um, and it has meant that I feel safe to engage in sport. Um, but there's, you know, there's a difference between active sport and dangerous sport, right? Like there's still things that uh we would want to avoid um i mean there's that but that's also uh, there's things i would want to avoid even if i was a you know normal person um so yeah there, 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 there's still lines um that you're going to have to discuss with your uh, treatment specialist but at least from my perspective um it's supported me a lot more in terms of starting um uh being more engaged in sport and being feeling supported on it oh well answered andrew Gold star, yeah. You go. That's 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 a five star rating from Vanessa. Yeah, <laughs> you did well. Yeah. Well, you know, Rory is a shot putter, so you know, um, it's a really important question, I think, for you, Rory. Um, of this one from Ross, um, for you, Andrew. Andrew, did you say you had an operation on him, Libra, and how did that go? Um, did you have Nova Seven during op due to the inhibitors? Yeah, so I, I had a um, keyhole surgery for appendicitis. Um, I had acute appendicitis, and we were all like, "It's a bleed! Uh, it's a it's a stomach <laughs> bleed! Run for our lives!" Like I got hospitalized, and we're telling all the nurses and doctors, "Like, oh, it's probably an internal bleeding episode." And they're doing a scan, and they're like, "We can't see any blood in there. We can't see any blood in there." And you know, we're in the full like sort of emergency zone, and then it took a little while for them to go, "Oh, it's appendicitis. That's what it is." Um, and so they had a look at that, and they were like, oh, the, some of the doctors were really keen to just try and treat it with antibiotics, but I'm immune suppressed because of my rituximab. So we were like, that's probably not going to work. We'd prefer to just go on the op. Um, and the surgeon was really, really good. They explained to me that in terms of the surgical process, they were really confident that it's a surgery that they had done a lot of times, so it wasn't something that was super risky. So in terms of their side, things were really easy and controlled. Um, I did have a little bit of Nova 7, I believe. It was in my first year of MSUSMAB, so I can't say that confidently. Vanessa, do you remember if I... I think I had Nova 7, but the op went fantastically. Yeah. Very, oh. very few bruising and no issues, yeah. Yeah, I think you did get a little bit of Novo, only because we haven't had much experience with Heme Libre and surgeries, yeah. But um, I can say at the centre we've had some ports removed, yeah, and we haven't required huge, you know, amounts of coverage, but we've also done um, uh, a recent hip, yeah, so hips are quite bleedy, yeah. And we've covered that. They all came through quite nicely. Yeah. And we back off quite quick, you know, um, afterwards. But some of the less oozier, bleedy surgeries, yeah, we are actually starting to question whether any covered is, is required. Yeah. I've had a few dental procedures as well where in the past I, that would have been a big deal. Uh, whereas now it hasn't been as much of an issue. Like the, the recovery time is just insane in terms of the comparison. It's it's night and day. Um, yeah, I, I don't have the same level of, uh, oh, I'm sore for weeks and weeks after um, exertion or after, uh, you know, doing something. Um, and that is the same for even those injuries or surgical procedures and stuff like that. Um, even just a little thing, like I used to get torrential blood noses and I still have the occasional blood nose, but it lasts for, you know, five minutes as opposed to an hour, two hours. Um, so yeah, it, it is the 
you know, the, these accidents and small incidents will still happen and they'll still be worse than a normal person, but they, it is a night and day compared to what life has been like for me. You know, it sounds like night and day, Andrew, and, um, you know, I really think that um, it's going to make such a big difference to so many, uh, so many people. Uh, so I can only reiterate how glad we are that um, the funding decision has been made. Um, absolutely. So look, I'm seeing that the questions um, have got a bit quiet, um, but that doesn't mean um, even after this webinar, if you have um, further questions, you can certainly contact us and we'll be more than happy to answer them and put you in touch with any of the any of the speakers that you've heard tonight. Um, but I thought before we close off for the evening, um, and good on you, there's still 38 past participants listening in so we've managed to hold your attention for more than an hour which is excellent on the weeknight um, but how about I um, just go around the zoom room um, starting with starting with Andrew and then on to Vanessa and then on to Danny if you had any other uh, final comments before we close for the evening so Andrew back to you not too much I think it's just the the difference that I've found in terms of just that forward planning like not having to over plan as much not having to go okay this is the plan if I get a bleed this is you know uh, if, if I have a bleed then I'll call this person and that you know that person will take me to school and um, oh and if I end up needing to stay the night then I will make sure I've got some medication with me and that sort of thing like the freedom to especially going into my university years and and, and that sort of thing to be spontaneous um is the the real valuable thing, you know, being able to go, oh, okay, I'll I'll crash here the night because you know I, I that's what works best for me, uh, socially or there on the day, um, and even just yeah, not having backup plans upon backup plans upon backup plans, um, but yeah, I, I guess I, my thing of encouragement would be. I felt like during the first month, two months, that I was going to be the one person who this didn't work for, um, that I was going to be the person who this this wouldn't work for, and it wouldn't be as much of a miracle as I'd seen it overseas. And it was really hard to learn to trust my body and learn to trust a new medication. Um, and I just want to encourage other people that if they're feeling that way to get in touch with the hemophilia treatment centers, I'm happy to take phone calls for that because I remember that that was a really scary time um, because we as leaders can feel like, you know, we're the unlucky ones that will always go wrong for. Um, but this is a, a honest to goodness win that works. Um, yeah. Yep. Um, great. So Vanessa, did you have any final comments? Yeah, I think I just saw one question about a blood bank in Wellington. Yeah, I don't know if that one's been answered, but um, uh, Hain yeah. Libra won't be stocked in the blood bank. Yeah, Hain Libra um, is dispensed by pharmacists, so you will need a pharmacy, whether that's an inpatient pharmacy via a hospital or your local pharmacy. That's mine, yeah parting words but call please call it's a good product yeah yeah and i've just seen um from sam you expect a full update on how i go on him libra well i'll i'll, I'll tell you all about it a few <laughs> months down the track <laughs> so um danny or, or michelle was there anything that you'd like to to add no nah, thanks dion um it was great to hear um that that andrew had a similar experience to what we noticed in in benya um, so for us, I just can't understate, um, the difference it made in family dynamics. So, f I mean, so I'm speaking from a parent perspective, obviously, and, um, cause I, my son's got it and so on, and it's just taken a lot of stress off us at, as parents. Um, and I think it's made us being hopefully fairer to all of our kids, as opposed to trying to favor one because of, um, because you know because of the conditional um so yeah it's just for us it's made a big difference the flexibility that the freedom that we've we've achieved um by having it it's just been been amazing and and i know it won't be the same for everyone but i i, I, I can't see a way that it's not um so that's you know again just personal experience but yeah thanks for the opportunity no, um, it's wonderful, and yeah, I can only echo. Um, wonderful to hear the stories and to hear more information about Hem Libra or Emma Susan Mab. I'll get my tongue around that eventually. 
Um, we're all very excited about it. I see another question was coming through, but Andrew was dutifully responding to that. So that's fantastic. Um, but as I say, if there's anything that comes up for you after this, or um, there's something that you wanted to ask but didn't quite type it in, or the technology wasn't quite doing what you expected it to do, just get in touch with us um, and we'll get the answer for you. Um, and, and, and that's really um, all I can say on that and just bring it on, looking forward to looking forward to having this available to everyone and being rolled out. Um, so a really um, a huge thanks again to everybody who spoke um, this evening. Um, big ups to all of the haemophilia treatment centres because I know that it's a lot of work ahead for you as well to roll it out for all of us. Um, and we're really um, grateful for that um, and really excited for it happening. Um, so with that, I think this is a good time to bring this uh, webinar to a close. Um, um, thank you all out there for your participation. Um, this will be posted um, on YouTube for others who are unable to be here. Um, so uh, promote it to those of you, those who you know weren't able to make it tonight. So there we are. Um, thank you very much. Have a good evening. Um, I hope you'll um, have a good rest and a great week ahead.